Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at ExpressVPN. Now today I want to talk about concealing my footprint, my digital footprint. You know, anytime I connect to a shady website on the internet, usually I want to make sure that my IP address, my public facing IP address, is generally hidden away from whoever is operating that website. But on a day like today where websites are banned behind ID locks and applications can suddenly be removed by government intervention, it's actually important that you get a VPN just so you can mask your location and IP address. And then get access to the entire world around you. And I'm talking beyond just watching the Netflix show that isn't available in your country. By using a VPN service like ExpressVPN, you basically have the ability to pick any server you want from any part of the world and pretend that you're a resident from that area. And who's gonna be wiser? <laughs> no one but you. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, one of the other reasons I use ExpressVPN is not because they're only out of a, uh, you know, five or 11 eye surveillance country, but also with their strict no log policy. ExpressVPN routes you through their connected, trusted server technology. And of course, many VPN VPNs will claim that they have a no-log policy, but ExpressVPN goes a bit further and creates servers entirely based in random access memory, also known as volatile memory. Volatile because as soon as you turn off the power, all of that information is zapped, gone, it's like it never existed. No logs kept on any hard drives, meaning that your caches are totally safe. And their privacy policy has been reassured to me, again, by their third-party audits from some of the largest assurance firms in the world, known as PwC and KPMG. If you want to start masking your digital footprint as well like me, please go over to expressvpn.com SOG and get an extra three months of ExpressVPN totally for free. Ladies and gentlemen, that is expressvpn.com SOG. Anyways, let's get on with the video. Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and today's video is all about myhouse.wad. You probably heard about this all over YouTube, some speedruns, popular videos have been made. But ladies and gentlemen, as a man who started with creepypastas, this is actually one of these uh, video game uh, videos where it's all about a creepy thing on the internet, a creepy internet campfire story. Ladies and gentlemen, this year, uh, two months ago, released a mod known as myhouse.wad which on the outside looks like a simple mod where you walk around somebody's house, kill a few demons, walk out of a gate and call it a day. But it has sparked hours of gameplay, it has multiple endings, and it's probably one of the most elaborate and spooky Doom mods created. Not just from a gaming perspective, but with the whole lore around it. So ladies and gentlemen, let's start with part one, the original forum post. So the way that this began was on September 2nd, 2022, in a thread on doomworld.com called Doom Pictures Thread 2022. And as you scroll down, people were sharing their various Doom maps. You got a little bit of a cyberpunky map over here. Uh, actually, super icy cyberpunky map. And then, of course, the more and more you scroll down, one image stuck out the hardest. This one right here by a forum member known as Veg. I haven't logged into the forums in over a decade, but a close childhood friend of mine passed away recently, and I decided to go through some of the Doom stuff we were making when we were kids. The hardest part was recovering the wads from my old 3.5-inch floppy disks. It took me a few hours, but I managed to recover some files from the late 90s when we were making maps. Most of it is completely forgettable, but apparently my friend was making a My House map around 1999. In his honor, I've been cleaning up his map for release and adding some Z-Doom UDMF features for the sake of convenience. Uh, this is, by the way, a brand new Universal Doom uh, map format, I believe. It's a new map format created for Doom modders. I haven't touched an editor for almost 15 years, but boy, is it a lot easier to make maps today than it was in the 90s. So a few screenshots were the inside of a house. Uh, of course, you can see this, uh, this shot from the outside with the garage half open. And that's pretty much where it came down to. Now, an internet guy like me, I looked up to Veg, and I realized that this guy joined up 2004, ladies and gentlemen. So this guy has been around the internet for a fair bit. The last time they ever visited was March 2nd. So, of course, they had a few posts. Their earliest post ever was 2006, for instance. The community is falling apart. A doom what about friendship and love. But, of course, after all of these posts made in 2006, 2006, the actual last post after literally not signing in for over 10 years, uh, this person posted on Doom Pictures Thread 2022, the post we had just seen. 
So of course, going up further and further and further, ladies and gentlemen, he released the mod on myhouse.wad. Excited to finally release this tribute map. Last August, I lost a good childhood friend of mine and took it pretty hard. When I was visiting my hometown for his funeral, I connected with his parents who shared with me some of his old belongings. And that's where the 3.5 inch floppy disks from high school had come out to. Thomas and I were into amateur doom mapping in the early 2000s, but I had never really seen this map of his prior to uncovering it on one of the old floppy disks. As a way of paying tribute to him and all the great memories we had together, I took the plunge and installed Doom Builder in order to polish up his map and add a few modern amenities just for convenience sake. So again, he hasn't touched an editor in 15 years, hit their words, and of course he said for this, you need Doom 2, the WAD, you need GZ Doom, which is a special version of Doom, a port that allows you to use upgraded hardware rendering techniques, and then it's got one map, around 10 minutes of playtime, all difficulty settings are implemented. Jumping and crouching disabled, free look is fine, lots of Doom cute. And of course, mixing maps of your house was all the rage back in the day, and where he said, miss you, Tom, you can click on this hyperlink and find out this is actually an image of Tom and his friend. Tom, unfortunately, has passed away. And now one of the things uh, I, I kind of believed was, who is Tom? But actually, looking at this individual right over here with the actual tie-on, uh, one of the links that I found here was of Stephen Nelson, age 35, formerly of Plano, Illinois. Passed away on August 3rd, 2022 in Oswego, Illinois. Stephen was born on March 13, 1987, and of course the entire obituary is right over here. But of course, looking here, we found another individual that is also recognizable if you're looking carefully. That's Tom! Now, as you download this My House, you can find out that there is more than just the actual game files, myhouse.pk3 and myhouse.wad. Myhouse.wad is actually just the home section without the further actual modifications done, which are in the larger Pack 3. The Pack 3 is actually what's been worked on and where there's been a lot of additions to the original uh, work found in the 90s. So, of course, there's an entire journal attached over here, written by the actual creator of this mod. And as you read through this, uh, again, you might want to pay attention because things do get kind of supernaturally. This is where it kind of becomes a story that's more of an ARG, more of a creepypasta. This is where I mentioned the creepypasta, and it's not necessarily related entirely to the game. That's not to disregard the entire journal itself. Obviously, if you want to read through this, you can. I just don't think it personally really adds a whole heck of a lot to the entire story. In fact, by the time we get to the end of it, beyond just these two obituaries, one of them we're about to read, which should absolutely spoil or raise some questions in your eyes about the entire surrounding nature of the story, uh, I don't necessarily believe all of that really adds to it. I think the game can speak on its own, especially considering the atmosphere that we're about to see. That said, though, there are a few sketches, there are actually a few photos that do lead a bit more credence uh, or, or actually help flesh out, I guess you could say, the world building of this wad a little bit more. And it's insane to say that we're talking about world building <laughs> exteriors, uh, exterior stuff when it comes to a doom wad to begin with. Clearly, there's a lot of effort, not just in the in, in the game part, but also the, the story that surrounds it. Whether that's designed to add a creepy flair or whether that's designed to, um, I guess you could say, just uh, add uh, more meat, if you will, to the, to the story behind posting it. Of course, there's also photos over here, uh, you know, uploaded from the actual creator of the mod. You've got a gas station, unknown, stop for directions. You've got images of the house, one that will be very recognizable as we play through this, and some photos from high school. And then, of course, as you go through over here, ladies and gentlemen, you've got shots of the bedroom, more shots of the high school, and uh, that's pretty much it. Here's a better shot of the home. You can see that this is the kitchen area, living, a dining room, and then a staircase headed to the bottom. And inside here contains an actual image of Thomas Allord, which actually we just saw earlier on, died in his home on August 3rd, 2022 in Oswego, Illinois. So how is it that Tom and both Steven have actually died. Anyways, we're getting way too hard with this story, okay? They've given us everything over here. Screenshot-wise, they're given screenshots of the actual mod, and then, of course, a sketchbook containing, what, a card key, and then, of course, uh, whatever appears to be this two-headed dog, which we'll find out as we play, and then, of course, a shot of the exterior of that house. So that said, I've kept you here on the hook long enough. Let's get into the video game. 
Okay, so let's guide you through how this mod works. Okay, so let's load it up into GZ Doom. So here initially I'm gonna walk you through all four endings. So ending A is the front gate. This is the easiest one to find within a few minutes. So you spawn in front of the house, you can move inside through the garage into the living room kitchen area, kill some low level enemies. And then eventually over here, you can find out that in the top floor, we'll call this uh, floor two, and then, uh, or sorry, uh, the second story. And then if you go down the stairs into the rec area, it'll be the first floor. That's how I'll kind of refer to these. So in the second floor, you can kill a few enemies and towards the bedroom, the master bedroom, you can find a yellow key. You might be able to pick up a shotgun off some of the stronger Marines. And if you go to the first floor, you can then use that yellow key and then go all the way to the bathroom on the first floor by the far end and open up the uh, red, uh, find the red key. Now, if you notice, according to the photos, the layout's kind of looking very similar. Now, at this moment in time, you can open up the boiler room, kill a few more enemies, walk back up to the garage, and enter back out. Now, if you walk around the yard, you'll notice very quickly that enemies have respawned on both floors. Go back inside, shoot them up again, and you'll notice some new paintings on the wall. Now, this is where you'll notice that the house is evolving. It's changing. It's more labyrinthine. You'll notice that there's paintings all over the wall. If you look behind you, there's a set of empty paintings, empty points, that all denote eight items that you need to actually pick up and grab. Using the red key, you can go to the laundry room, open the door, get the blue key, open the front gate, and escape. Now, this moment you load up Underhaul, which is an actual official Doom map, and this is where you can even pick up the Super Shotgun, and you can use it and uh, only get it in this level, be mindful, and bring it back after beating the Underhaul to respawn into the My House map. This is ending one, the front gate ending, the ending that anybody is going to pick up, but this is not where the game shines. The next ending is the breaker box, or I guess the bad ending, the one ending I discovered on my first actual blind playthrough. To understand, you start off with the garage, kill the same enemies on the first entry, grab the yellow key in the upstairs bathroom, then grab the red key, and then do a walk around to spawn the enemies again. Go inside and exercise all the enemies once again, and then go to the second floor bathroom where we found the key, just to find a tougher enemy and a yellow skull. You take that yellow skull, go to the first floor bathroom, and pick up a red skull. Then you use the red skull and go all the way to the laundry room to discover that now there is an attic. You go up there and find a blue skull. <laughs> and then you go back to the first two floors and notice how you cannot escape the house since every exit has been removed. Once again, the layout of the house is constantly evolving. Go to the second floor, and if you notice near the laundry room, some new doors have actually spawned in. This new door takes you to a rec room with a fireplace and has one item that you can get. A soda can that, picks, uh, that, that actually denotes, I want pop, when you pick it up. Now at this moment in the living room, if you've noticed that set of paintings I brought up again, it'll actually have the can of pop denoted on there. You gotta find eight key items before you get to the ending of the game in order to trigger an actual good ending. Now it's kind of like Yumi Nikki, if you remember me playing that years ago on my channel, where the entire world was labyrinthine, there were some static locations, but you had to find a few items in order to get the proper good ending of the game. An ending very depressing, that is. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, eventually I bumbled around only to end up at the boiler room and noticing this little outline on the wall. Going near it, I fell down a rabbit hole and entered the other main area of the game, the Brutalist Apartments. Now, immediately you're gonna notice that this game is filled with liminal spaces. Uh, it invokes horror, and to be honest, the game really digs into it because if you use some of the cheats, like no clip, it'll actually no clip you into the back rooms where an enemy is waiting for you to kill you and send you all the way back to the beginning. Now, I wanna start off by mentioning even the cheats here give you some hints. Now there's no real like loss into using the cheats and if you want to use them in order to help the exploration of the world, I highly do recommend it. But of course on your first playthrough, you should probably try to go through it as honest as you can. The cheats, however, do give you hints when you use them about the actual game's lore. So for instance, if you use ID clip, it'll tell you be careful not to clip out of reality in the wrong areas. And of course ID KFA, which is of course, you know, it's not about the, it's about the journey, not the destination. IDFA, if you find yourself exploring another map, bring a super shotgun back with you. ID Chopper says, leave the entrance to the bathroom unsullied for a big fucking reward. IDDQD, God mode, my reflection winked at me, I covered the mirror in the attic just to be safe. And if you use the same cheat of God mode to turn it off, there's no good outcome from a house fire. 
IDB Hold says the living room painting holds a clue if you find all the artifacts. IDMUS, this isn't the D running you know. Let it play out. So of course, these cheats, if you use them, give you hints about the actual location. And the more and more you see this playthrough, the more it's gonna actually make sense. Okay, so once I enter the Brutalist Apartments, one of the things you'll notice is the music has actually changed too. When I was first playing this, it sounded like a lot of the Silent Hill 2 ambient mixes that I constantly listen to on YouTube while I'm editing. But I'll get into all the uh, audio quickly at the end of this video because it plays a really, really important role as well. But going back to the game right over here, inside the apartment, you'll notice the layout is actually similar to the original house, except no furniture. You get a cute dog, and across the house, you'll notice other apartments, some with the lights on, and some with people actually spying on you. Creepy. So of course, this whole section reminds me of the hotels from the back rooms, and I wanted to point out the connection, because if you watch through this whole video, you're gonna be noticing a whole heck of a lot of liminal spaces that are triggering all the synapses in your head. So what happens in this area, the Brutalist Apartments, is a lot of warping. There's actually two apartments. It's the same layout, except the scale of the apartment is actually larger in one. And with the larger layout, you also have a two-headed dog, which we've seen in some of the sketchbooks earlier. Uh, you'll have to run away from this dog. You can kill it if you have the cheats enabled, but you'll notice that not everything in this map is supposed to be killed. There's actually a lot of moments where you're supposed to be running away. Um, so just keep that in mind. Falling out of the open windows here takes you to street level, which basically brings you to the stairway that has three warps. One where you open the door and connect to another staircase. One where it takes you to this heaven location where nothing happens. And the other that drops you into this acid trip hallway that warps you back to the original house. So again, at this moment I found out when I went back to the original house, there were some new rooms on the second floor. So it took me to a luxury apartment where I picked up an item that said, this kid needs a milkshake. And then of course, the uh, rec room where you picked up the pop. These are all key items that you need to grab onto. And then I found something on the first floor by the pool table, a shelf. I pushed it aside, went in and found a breaker box that when I touched it, all hell broke loose. Screams, people just screaming, demons, ghosts popped up, new enemies that I hadn't noticed in the original game. Sky was all red, and when I went upstairs, the house appeared to be burned down, patches of wall completely gone, and the house was infested entirely with demons. Now up here you find a couple items that don't serve any purpose. If anything, these items just give you a very grim reminder of what happened around this house. Uh, words like prompts like innocence lost, so to speak. And then of course, you go back to those Brutalist apartments, where I eventually found another way down after a few more drops that took me around half an hour of discovery. The warps and, and transitions really do throw you for a loop. Now once I reached the end of this tunnel, I found a breaker box and it took me to an abandoned parking lot. Working my way up through the only staircase brought me to this airport, completely empty, another liminal space. And then of course, according to the departure screen, it was past 9, 9 p.m., the flights had ranged all the way from Beijing to Puerto Vallarta with one labeled home. And it's interesting to know that the word canceled has been misspelled every single time it's been written. The only flight on time here is the one that leads all the way to Dallas. What the significance here is, I don't know. I think it's just designed to be creepy. There's a gift shop with nothing. The bathrooms were empty, except for a female bathroom where you had a hell zone in. And of course, if you remember that cheat we talked about earlier that hinted at a big fucking reward, it's the BFG 9000. I never got it for my playthroughs, but uh, you can if you try really hard. I think there's a certain way of navigating and triggering the encounter where you can pick up the BFG and then just, you know, use it as a uh, kill all weapon. Eventually, I went all the way to gate four where the plane was uh, there. I went in, found it empty. There were oxygen masks hanging all over the aisle, basically denoting a depressurized plane. I head to the front, pulled something in the cabin and triggered an alarm. Turned down the aisle, ran down, shot a couple ghosts, and then eventually I jumped out onto the ground. And at this moment, I spawn in the upstairs bedroom in the house and I found that it was actually burned down and nature was trying to reclaim. I leave the house, I turn around and I notice a for sale sign. And then of course, I take the exit and it takes me to the under halls. Now this is, from what I understand, the bad ending. It happened because I flipped a breaker box. Remember, nothing good comes out of a house fire. So of course, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for me to go and get that lovely 
good ending, okay? And this is where things get really cryptic. Like, we're talking Silent Hill, Resident Evil. No, 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 I'm joking. PT levels of cryptic. Remember that game from Hideo Kojima? The game where you had to do, like, everything imaginable in order to trigger any changes in the loops? This game's design actually mirrors PT quite a lot. You have to do a lot of cryptic shit to actually make some progress. And if you make some few mistakes, you will never get that good ending. So make sure you make a lot of saves before you continue through. Otherwise, you're gonna be pulling your hair out. So to get the good ending, I went to the garage. I picked up the chainsaw to make my life a whole lot easier. I cleared the house of all the enemies, grabbed the keys, walked out and circled the property and killed everything in the house once again. Then I went to the attic and this time I pulled down the mirror with the curtain. Remember that IDDQD cheat? Yeah, I, I, you gotta really read the cheats in order, to, uh, in order to understand what you want to do, what you want to be doing in the story. So at this moment I grab the blue skull, I head to the top floor powder room, because you remove the curtain, you can actually jump through this window, and then you enter the mirror house, a brand new area we didn't see before. The mirror house is an exact replica of the original house, except completely mirrored, as you can imagine. But going to the attic allows you to grab a new item, this bomb-looking thing that says, Christmas makes me happy. Going back to the, going to the back of the attic showed a baby bottle in a crib with the description, it wasn't meant to be. I'm assuming a child couldn't be born. Or the dream of parenting was gone. One or the other. Jumping back through the same window brings you back to the house with a breadcrumb trail of ball pit balls, I guess, leading you all the way down to the first floor bedroom that has a tunnel connecting through the floorboards. Jumping down this tunnel takes you to a ball pit that's part of a daycare? I mean, you got Shrek on the wall, there's a playmat that every kid has seen literally awaiting you. And in this location, you got two items that you need to grab. Crayons that prompt adult coloring books and a baseball prompting autograph by J.J. Hardy. So once you get these items, a new door spawns in one of the back rooms that'll take you to the outside where you have a boss battle with Shrek. I actually had to put this footage into the editing software, raise the gamma levels to make sure that Shrek wasn't wearing a bra and panties. I literally thought that Shrek was dressed like he was on the streets for a minute. And thank God he wasn't like that, okay? I don't know why I thought that. Maybe the darkened silhouette got me a little bit hot and bothered. Just wanted to mention that for the video. So after this, uh, I guess, boss fight, he drops a gate key, but before you leave, look around the area for a swing set that has a kid's toy that prompts shugs. So of course you go through this gate now and you end up back at the house. Go upstairs to the rec room, get that soda pop, go to the high-end apartment and pick up that milkshake. These are all key items, you need them. Now, of course, at this point, you'll notice you only need three more. So now here's where the other cryptic stuff begins. Find every sink in the house, turn it on, and eventually you should be able to flood the bathtub in the upstairs bathroom. Once you flood it, you can jump in, go to the bottom, and if you're on a VM like me, you'll notice there's, there's a traversal stutter. This is kind of denoting a, a, a teleportation, a silent teleport, which this map heavily relies on to make these maps seem dynamic. So once you go to the bottom of the bathtub, you come back up, you'll notice, oh shit, the house is flooded. So now you work your way down the staircase and eventually to the first floor, you look back, walk through the water, and you'll realize you are now in this pool section. So again, another, I guess, reference to the back rooms lore. But now this moment, you'll notice my frame rate drops hard. I'm running it in a virtual machine. I don't know why it was late at night. Uh, I figured I'd just isolate GZ Doom into its own Windows virtual machine. Wasn't really a smart idea. Later on in the video, I do in fact dig out the save file and just run it natively under Linux anyways. But uh, yeah, if you're worrying about the low frame rate, it's not YouTube bugging out, it's me. So of course, this is a tough location. And I think the low frame rate explains well because it's not just enemies that this game is spawning at an unhealthy rate. It's actually the map size itself is so massive that uh, trying to navigate it is, is genuinely confusing. So again, eventually you'll find some shower rooms and you want to eventually get your way to this pool area. Now in this pool towards the deep end, there are five holes. You go into the center one, work your way through the water until you reach this heaven section. Now here you'll find some walkways that are levitated into the air. You walk halfway down, turn right, and walk all the way in this hidden path, this invisible like walkway, and you pick up a neck, you pick up a key item, a ring that says, I do. So of course you work your way back down this hallway and you enter the brutalist apartments again. 
So here, if you navigate enough, avoid the big dog, you'll find the dog bowl, you'll find the pumpkin rick item. Yeah, that's a real item. And with, the, so with some parkour, you'll find the cat food. Once you find all these three items, now you can find that breaker box again, jump down a few rabbit holes and work your way to the airport again. Once you're at the airport, you fight the evil bathroom encounter that I missed initially. I did not get the BFG 9000, unfortunately, but I did go all the way to the airplane, gate four, uh, you know, flicked the uh, alert, jumped out the back, and this time I ended up back in the house, except it wasn't actually burned. Now, you can actually leave the house and it won't despawn on you. So what do you do next? Well, again, in cryptic fashion, you go all the way to the back uh, yard, you can touch the fence, interact with it until you eventually find a secret door. It'll open up, you enter it, and you'll get to a new section that I'm gonna call the highway. Now the highway is dark, it's gonna lag, it's gonna be confusing, but you wanna walk down until you eventually find a empty car with the radio running. You might recognize the music, again, we'll get to it a bit too, but uh, this is where you go down a clearing until you eventually find an empty gas station. Now again, the frame rate is so low here that I just switched it out completely and uh, now it's running super smooth. Okay, I should have done that in the beginning, but hey, we live and we learn, right? So of course, in this gas station, uh, the music is relaxing, um, nobody's there, but in the back, you'll find a bathroom and a storage room. You go to the storage room, you pick up a Atari controller and over here, it literally will say, now it's my turn, or it's my turn. Then you go to the bathroom and then you turn around and bam, you're back in the house. So ladies and gentlemen, you go out back through the same exit. And then of course you go through the highway to the gas station. This time you make a hard right, then another hard right, head down until you find a clearing in the side of the road that takes you to a campfire. Now over here, you'll find a tree that has the engravings S and A. And you can get one of the endings here. If you choose to walk through, nothing will happen. And this is just one of the endings. This isn't the good ending. No, in order to get the good ending, there's something more cryptic. You don't walk through here. You just unlock the door. You head all the way back to the gas station. And then you see the car, which at this point is just a flashlight. You walk all the way down the highway until you see this fence, head into the clearing, and you'll be back home. Now, if you're pretty astute, you'll notice the house is actually mirrored. So what do you do? You avoid the demonic presence, go to the bathroom upstairs, jump through the mirror and get into the normal house. Now everything here is uber fucked, okay? So you better have a shit ton of ammo if you want to actually fight these guys. Pro tip, just have God mode. You'll have a great time letting your catharsis go, but what you want to do is avoid every goddamn demon force, run all the way to the back through the actual entrance, which should now be completely open, jump through, get to the forest clearing again, sorry, the highway. Once you're in the highway, you go down eventually until you get to the gas station again. Except over at the gas station, ladies and gentlemen, it's really bad. Because at this point, the game spawns literally every single enemy I think it logistically can in the actual engine. Your goal here is either fight, which I think you can do with the BFG 9000, or run all the way to the hard right to that forest clearing where eventually you'll find the campfire again run through the uh, open tree and bam ladies and gentlemen you have gotten the ending a secret is revealed now at this point a dog will be there you'll find s and a carved into the sand below and this is the actual ending to the game you might be like damn muda it is cryptic and you're right it is but this game really does reward exploration and that's pretty much the key of it nothing in this game is something that you'll be very keen on missing so you'll just really have to experiment and play around with it until you eventually do get to this ending. But from what I know, there's like four other endings that I haven't even heard about. So there is a lot of secrets to discover out of it. So let's go back to the map. Now to understand, I threw this map into something known as Slade, which allowed me to open up the PK3 file and see how confusing the map actually was. And one thing is certain, the map is not designed by somebody new to mapping tools. This is probably one of the most intricately designed Doom maps that I've ever seen. It's not just a multiple amount of maps, it is a singular map with a very clever use of invisible teleportations that allow the entire house to have the illusion of it manipulating constantly. So to understand, you've got line portals in GZ Doom's engine, you've got silent teleports, and you've got seamless transitions between multiple areas that effectively give you the idea of an evolving home. 
And of course, ladies and gentlemen, there are literally a crap ton of permutations that exist in about every area that this map potentially gives you. So when it comes to enemy placements and layouts and how those enemies persist well after you kill them, it's all the same map and it's all loaded at the same time. And there's so many different zones and warps. What appears to be a constantly evolving and looping house is really just a carefully designed doom map that just has you going between multiple states uh, of, of the same exact house. Now, of course, if you use the in-game auto mapping tool, you'll probably find out that it's pretty useless because the entire auto map is set to like full black. So even if you use this as a way to locate, you can't. You literally have to go with landmarks and you have to just explore and note things down for yourself. Now, when I looked into the actual files that were part of this mod pack, one of them was the actual journal, which if you read through, can get kind of paranormally at, at times. It can, it can have a lot of paranormal-ish events. It, it, it's basically a log of the individual like creating the actual like mod pack day by day. And this is where like you can kind of see the ideas of like creepy pastas kind of come into. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really think the journal is all that important. I read through a good portion of it. And I didn't really find it to be that important to the overall game. I think if you're going to get anything worthwhile out of it, it's probably the game itself, not necessarily the journal section. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, if you look further into it, a few other people that have analyzed this have compared it directly to a book known as The House of Leaves, which is a documentary novel that effectively focuses on a constantly changing labyrinth of a home. In fact, it's even referenced that the actual like house of the end, uh, where you see the sale sign, Navidson Realty for sale, the actual name of the family in that book, from what I understand, is Navidson. So again, cute references all around. The music, from what I've been able to understand, is actually an MP3 uh, version of like a distorted version of a song called Running From Evil. This individual is Leyland Kirby, also known as the Caretaker, who's been working in ambient musicscapes for quite a long time, and their works are quite inspiring. The track that was used uh, in this, Running From Evil, from what I understand, really does hit on the notes of dementia, which do cover a... Uh, basically, you'll hear the same song throughout the, the track, the same piece, but obviously the distortion gets heavier to signify, um, you know, obviously your mind losing the ability to recall or, or, or whatnot. So it's uh, it's an interesting piece, and of course it's not the only song that was used. I think the music itself just serves its purpose. There are moments in time where the sound design gets so good that there are moments where, as I was explaining, the pool room section, the pool section of the house, it was constantly getting louder and louder and louder. And I wasn't really thinking dementia. I was just thinking like the ghosts around me were hunting me down. It actually was one of the scariest moments in the entire playthrough for me as I was playing this mod. And playing it at two in the morning and listening to that alone definitely made me stay up the rest of the night. I'm not even kidding with you. It's horror like that, little touches like that that do so good that I, I, I just have to like mention it. The actual music that was playing in the radio of the car, which is apparently known as the most mysterious song on the internet. Uh, apparently it's a recording from the 1980s and nobody really knows anything about this song uh, entirely. So looking into like the history behind it, obviously that first obituary that I showed you was a bit of a, a, a spoiler. There was supposed to be a QR code that you could scan that would give you that obituary. And apparently if Steve was to actually have programmed this in the memory of Tom, according to these obituaries, it seems like both Steve and Tom had both died. So realistically, how the fuck did Steve program this game? Uh, again, I don't know if the story was entirely true. I have no idea to confirm the deaths of Steve and Tom or any of these people, whether they actually exist. If anything, looking at some of these photos, they kind of have some Photoshop tinge to them as well. So it's really hard for me to confirm anything. Obviously, another thing that I can't confirm is the actual, you know, development of this too. For somebody that wasn't like keen on developing maps, for 15 plus years and just magically got a Doom like map modding tool, uh, they created what is in fact one of the more intricate maps that we've seen in Doom modding history. So realistically, it seems like somebody created an interesting story, a story about loss, grief, and, and, and really coping with loss and grief, coping with death, coping with a lot of negative uh, trauma that they've dealt with. And they've created a video game adaptation of this book. 
All in all, all I can really say is it just seems like a very, very talented map maker that just decided to create this over the course of what I have to imagine has been years, months, where they've created an intricate, well-designed technical map for Doom with an interesting story about, you know, uh, an individual that has passed away, dealing with honoring them, but ultimately creating a game that is a video game adaptation of an amazing book that deals with themes about loss, that deals with themes about grief, uh, you know, various, various heavy, heavy, heavy things. And they've created a video game version of what is coping. And I think that's impressive, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's absolutely goddamn brilliant to see. My house has been called one of the most, uh, you know, creepy, one of the most, like, uh, you know, scariest Doom maps, one of the most depressing Doom maps in some cases. But I think it's just one of the most impressive Doom maps in terms of what the community is able to come up with. This is a game that is as old as me, if not older. And this community is so alive that they've taken it to the absolute technical edges and created a goddamn masterpiece out of it. Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you enjoyed today's video. Uh, if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.